The American chestnut tree was one of the most abundant and dominant trees in the eastern United States Appalachian chain. They were gorgeous trees. It is actually the tree that inspired the Christmas song, Chestnuts Roasting on an Open Fire. It was a, a very heavily used resource by people. In the late 1800s, people brought Asian chestnuts to North America as an ornamental tree, and they carried with them a disease, a fungal blight, and it infected Native American chestnut trees and just wiped them out completely. Over 99% of the population was obliterated. Fast forward nearly a hundred years and a team led by William Powell at the State University of New York was able to actually discover why the blight kills the chestnut tree. And they have produced a strain of chestnut trees that is 100% resistant to this fungal blight. It really shows that there's no point of no return there's potentially no point you can get where you can't end up recovering and healing the damage that's happened. And that's the hope that biotechnology brings to conservation. The UN is issuing a dire warning on climate change. Nearly a million species are at risk of extinction because of humans. We are doing irreparable harm to Earth's biodiversity. Uh, and what is clear is that we're driving species to extinction. The human species has driven the planet's biodiversity into an unprecedented decline. The extinction rate is a thousand times higher than it naturally would be with as many as one million species at risk. Many scientists say we are in a sixth mass extinction. The decline in biodiversity is a crucial issue that is largely overlooked in the public consciousness in terms of how important it really is. Our existence as humans is deeply intertwined with the health and flourishing of a number of non-human species. If you destroy the environment, it's going to turn around and bite back. We need to radically rethink our relationship to the natural world. We need to understand that we are a deeply entrenched part of it, certainly not separate from it. This is part of what is killing other species and eventually us too. Traditional conservation methods alone are struggling to offset the speed at which we're losing species and habitats. Biotechnologies that have been developing in the wings are now offering the hope of new, if not controversial, ways of saving endangered species. Genetic rescue traditionally has been the, the practice of increasing a population's genetic diversity um, in a way to benefit it. Um, usually when the population is exhibiting some type of problem like inbreeding or whatnot, we're trying to increase genetic diversity or increase the viability of the genetics of a population, then in that kind of very core definition, biotechnologies offer a whole host of ways to do that. Biotechnology offers everything from genetic insight to restoring diversity with cloning or technologies or doing gene editing to aid disease resistance, um, all the way to that moonshot of using all those technologies to restore something like a woolly mammoth or a passenger pigeon. The process of resurrecting species like this is known as de-extinction, and it's one of the more complex and controversial applications of this biotechnology. Because of by the technology, we can bring back those kind of animals. But of course, it is, it is a tedious work to do, but it is not impossible. De-extinction is a scientific movement, we could say, an emerging space of researchers who are trying to use a variety of different biotechnologies in order to help recreate um, close approximate versions of extinct species so that they can create new animals that mimic extinct species and can go back out into the wild spaces where extinct species used to roam and carry out important ecological roles there that have disappeared since certain species went extinct. The very first example of de-extinction, if you call it that, is the bucado, which is a um, Pyrenean ibex, so kind of a mountain goat. The last bucado died in Spain, it was a single animal, but they took some cells from its ear and preserved those. 
and years later they used those cells to to clone a bucado using a, a domestic goat as the surrogate so they they could create cells implant uh, an embryo in a goat and the goat gave gave birth to a live bucado the species was brought back only to go extinct again just 10 minutes later due to lung defects the 2003 resurrection of the bucado remains the closest that anyone has gotten to true de-extinction at least for now in 2017, George Church's Woolly Mammoth Project captured the public's imagination and brought de-extinction back into conversation. So de-extinction is, is really just a little bit of hybridization um, but using ancient DNA and some modern synthetic DNA to achieve a goal of, say, cold resistance or pathogen resistance. Church hoped to adapt the genome of the woolly mammoth's closest living relative, the Asian elephant, to include a number of mammoth traits, in particular, how to thrive in the cold climate of the Arctic. We are using the tools of paleogenomics, which is the ability to actually get DNA sequences from those extinct species from hundreds or thousands of years ago and, and look at their genetic code, compare it to their living relatives and start to understand what are the unique fragments of DNA that made them uh, do what they did in the environment. Two, there's now something called gene editing, which is most famously done with CRISPR-Cas9. It's an enzyme and RNA combination that basically is a, a, a homing system that allows scientists to target any region of DNA in a living cell's genome and make a cut and then make an edit to that area. So we could take the hemoglobin gene in an Asian elephant's genome and cut it and overwrite in its place the hemoglobin allele from a woolly mammoth, which will change how it bonds oxygen at different temperatures. And that's something that George Church's lab has already done in culture in a Petri dish. So it used to be a big deal to make one precise change in the genome of an animal. We've made 42 changes in pigs. We now have 2,000 adult pigs of that, uh, that are called three point, version 3.0 that are uh, used for organ do donations, and that's being tested now in preclinical trials. That shows we can do 42 in a cell in a lab and then move the nucleus into uh, an egg and, and um, bring it to term all the way to adulthood, thousands of times. Uh, so we want to do the same thing in elephants, which are a little bit bigger than pigs, a little slower, but otherwise should be a very similar uh, procedure. While altering the genome of living animals like the Asian elephant could help bring a version of extinct species back to life, it could also help to rescue a species which is itself endangered. We want something that has all the advantages um, of cold resistance, possibly resistance to pathogens like the EHV virus that's uh, almost extinction level. Uh, harm to the Asian elephant, which is an endangered species. So you can consider it a, a hybrid, but it also, we can use synthetic biology to say, uh, alter tusk length to avoid uh, poachers. So there's a number of opportunities here that, that is not limited to the extinction of genes. Church wants to reintroduce his hybrids into the Arctic tundra, which he hopes will preserve an environment that's crucial to storing carbon. Science has proven de-extinction is possible, and the environmental argument for doing it is clear. Yet, questions still remain. Doing de-extinction, there's a whole lot of unknowns. And especially when you're, you're trying to think about a species like a woolly mammoth that's been gone for thousands of years, what are the prospects for being able to put this back in the appropriate kind of environment? Does woolly mammoth habitat even exist anymore? And if you go for very long extinctions, the further back you go, the more uncertainty, the less we know about the species, and the less likely there is to be a place for it now. The technical ability is outrunning our ability to think about is this a sensible or a useful thing to do? And there's this concern that, you know, if we're dealing with something as fundamental as the genetic makeup of species and thinking about putting them back out into the wild, you know, the genie's out of the bottle a bit. 
what does it mean to take the tools from synthetic biology and merge them with the more traditional conservation biologists who are losing the game as we're you know also losing more species can really fruitful combinations be born from this hybridization of knowledge sets and indeed it seems to be happening there are interesting projects getting off the ground when you bring these two different ways of looking at nature together something that's engineerable and something that's worth saving <laughs>